Welcome to the Death Science Podcast, where we explore new perspectives on life, death, dying, and the dead. Please like, share, and subscribe to support. You can find the audio on all major podcast platforms, and you can find the video at www.catacomb.tv. You can learn a lot more about this show at deathscience.org. Welcome to episode number seven. Today's guest is Captain Brad White, the founder of New England Burials at Sea. We'll be talking about stuff like cremated remains and full body burial at sea, as well as talking about exactly how legal it is to do the classic Viking style burial with an archer, flames, boats, oh, as well as his training with the FBI and becoming a captain and so much more, including a couple free gifts from Captain Brad White just for listening. But before we get started, I want to talk about catacombculture.com. This is where I sell my sculptures. My sculptures being functional home decor I make out of hyper-realistic human bones that I also make. From human bone lamps to food safe skull bowls, I make a lot of momentum more friendly pieces that serve as reminders that our lifespans are limited, so let's make the best out of the time we have left. Explore my bone gallery at catacombculture.com. Also, restinggrounds.org. This site will guide you in exploring alternative post-life care for your deceased body. Your deceased body has the potential to literally save lives, advance multiple fields of science, and so much more. Learn more at restinggrounds.org. Now, let's meet Captain Brad White and explore new perspectives on life, death, dying, and the dead. So on today's episode, we're here with Captain Brad White. He is the founder of New England Burials at Sea. Welcome to the catacombs, Captain Brad White. How are you today? Thank you, Jeremy. I am absolutely great. And thanks so much for having me aboard your terrific show. Oh, great. Yeah, my pleasure. So uh, you offered uh, in the pre-show, uh, what kind of special offer are you willing to give to the audience members? Oh, I think we got to tease that a little bit so people watch the uh, watch the program. But we've got something nice worth almost $100 for anybody that chooses to do a burial at sea with us in the year 2020. Great, great. Yeah, and we'll mention that more towards the end of the show for sure, for sure. So now give me a basic rundown of exactly what a sea burial is. Just the, the basics right here. Sure. So we are from boats from Maine to Miami and San Diego up to Seattle with 86 different boats departing out of 73 ports now. New England Burials at Sea was basically born back in the year 2006. And I created it, nurtured it, built it. And now we do hundreds and hundreds for people all around the world. And we have three types of offerings, Jeremy. One is a scattering at sea for human cremated remains by boat and a scattering by sea for human cremated remains by airplane and a full body burial at sea that's authentic back to the War of 1812. And I say authentic is I replicated everything that was done, buffed it up to today's standards, and we have almost 2,000 people lined up for a full body burial at sea for when their time comes in their final chapter of life. So I have to ask, um, so typically when I put it out there to my, my social media um, audience, like, oh, what is your dream funeral looking like? I always, always, always get a handful of individuals that talk about a Nordic or Viking funeral where the essentially the body is placed out in a small boat and it's released out into the water and then an archer shoots a flaming arrow straight to the boat, lands, lights everything on fire, and the burning boat slowly drifts away. Now, is this legal? Is it possible? <laughs> Tell me about this. Have you heard about this before? Well, I certainly have, and you're 100% accurate. It goes back to almost 700 AD, so it's a very old Nordic tradition. And they actually sometimes use very large boats, and they celebrated the life of the decedent with gifts and people and celebration. And then they went out and they laid hay in the boat. And as you just described, they put also lemons and limes in to prevent scurvy. And they had an archer that could uh, ignite it with uh, uh, you know, a lit arrow. And then the boat would burn to the waterline. 
So when we started this business back in 2006, seven, right around in there, we had a number of requests for Viking full body burials at sea. Now, it's rather complex when you get to the legal side of it because the U.S. Coast Guard and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, regulate what goes in the ocean. So anytime you, quote, scuttle a vessel, which means uh, sinking a vessel without an engine in it, making sure that there are no uh, chemicals or anything like that, you have to advise and notify the Coast Guard. And right now, those laws and regulations are 200 miles to sea to scuttle a vessel. So that's quite far. That's a multi-day trip. It's a big deal. And we've we didn't really know that there was a 200 mile limit on that when we started. So I put together a Viking burial at sea program, which included an Olympic archer from Plymouth Plantation in Plymouth, Massachusetts, which is right down the street. And great looking archer in a loincloth and professional uh, uh, archer. And uh, he was on deck and ready to go. We have a number of people that call to ask for it. And we just can't simply do it legally. So we then transitioned to a scattering at sea Viking burial style with a balsa wood boat, which is about uh, 36 inches long, made by a model boat builder on Long Island, New York. And we then put the same hay, the, le the lemons and the limes, and the urn with the cremated remains in it. And then we ignite that with a flare or some diesel fuel, and that balsa wood boat will burn to the water line, and then it turns over and allows the cremated remains to start traveling, which we'll talk about shortly and where they go. So our preference is not to do that because fire in a boat, not good. Uh, so we try to uh, suggest to client customers that while that was a, you know, almost 2000 year old uh, tradition for the Nordics, that we more or less make that a little bit more current and celebrate the life in a different way where we use either an ocean-friendly urn, which I can show you a sample of, or we scatter right from the temporary urn that comes from the crematory. Because you know what? Cremated remains are beautiful. They're sterilized minerals. And when they go in the water, they create a huge ash plume. And we'll talk about how we do a scattering at sea. And you know what? That gives the client's family the healing power and process to really get closure. So Nordic is good, interesting, fun to talk about. But the real thing is when, when we've done thousands and every single event is different, uh, we encourage folks to see, touch, and feel the cremated remains in their bag before they go overboard because that, because death is real. And that really allows you to process and realize that grandpa is now traveling the warm ocean currents forever. So that's a long answer to your question, but I hope it helps uh, uh, give you a little background. So how long has sea burial been around? About 300 years. And it's not a new concept. But with my background, my degrees in management from Ithaca College in New York, and for almost two decades, I worked for the Sharper Image Company in San Francisco and all parts around the country and the world. And that's where I really learned incredible white glove customer service. In the week that somebody has a loved one pass, that's the most critical, sad week of their life. And it's our goal and mantra to immediately talk with that person to learn about the decedent, to establish credibility and reliability, because we're that family's best friend for a week. And we really take it very seriously. We do this full time every single day, and we learn in every single event. And we've had events with no people, up to 400 people. We do unattended, so that's the no people part. And uh, what I did is I decided to take kind of a chore and turn it into a real celebration of life. So when you look back 300 years, what I did is I went to the Boston Public Library because we had so many requests for a full body burial that you, the Coast Guard didn't have the answers, the Navy didn't have the answers. So I said, let me just go study what it was like. And we replicate now everything that was done back to the War of 1812 from the burial shroud, the size of it, the, the form and shape of it, and to the weight of it, how we use cannonballs made by the same factory that makes them for old Ironsides, the oldest commissioned warship on the planet. And uh, by doing that and having a lot of care, attention to detail, and top quality, 
people come back, not only for grandpa, but for dad or a brother. So we've seen families three and four times over because we have a very high customer service level. So how is sea burial legal nowadays? Like who and why are they allowed to perform sea burials? Anything you put in the ocean is called ocean dumping. We don't like to use that word with the family, but when they ask, we tell them. It's regulated by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And the regulation is as follows. For scattering at sea, we have to be at least three miles to sea east of the line of demarcation. What that means is it rules out rivers, lakes, streams, bays. And we'll come back to that because we developed a product that will hopefully allow us to do that. So remember to ask me about that. Uh, for a full body burial, it's the same distance regulation, three miles to sea, but also 600 feet of water depth. And that varies on both coasts. For instance, where I am in Massachusetts, we have to go 45 miles offshore to get to 600 feet, and then a little bit more, 700, 800 feet. In New York, we have to go almost 100 miles. And in Miami or Fort Lauderdale, we only have to go about 11. In San Diego, all the way up to uh, Oregon and Washington, we only have to go about eight to 10 miles because out there the depths are two or 3,000 feet. So depth is our friend. And the regulation is rather intricate, and we specialize in this now, in that you can use a casket, but we don't. We don't, we don't, because it's non-ocean friendly, non-biodegradable. For instance, in the state of New Jersey, they retire old rail cars and bring them out on a ship and drop them overboard because they create terrific structure for fish life, for striped bass, for lobsters. But the ocean currents are so strong, they can break those, and they do, break those rail cars right in two. So we don't want to put a casket on the ocean floor bottom and have it reappear someday. Not good for business, not good for the family. So I developed a burial shroud made of a uh, cotton canvas duck. And this is a, a sample of what it looks like, if you can see that. Let's see, uh, I'm kind of a tight on a camera shot here, but it's got uh, grommets on the bottom to let air out and sea life in. It has grommets on the back, and these are made of a nice, nice cotton canvas that is designed to degrade in three to six months. And then in the bottom, we put cannonballs. Now, our patent pending on this is the cannonballs are separate from the uh, body. And by the way, this is a miniaturized version I can show you uh, on video, or I can, I teach a lot of classes around the country for continuing education, so I can carry this. Uh, and then here we have a memory pocket where you can put uh, pictures and chocolates and medals. And on this side is a piece of Velcro, not on the sample, but a piece of Velcro where we can put a small Monte Cristo cigar size high definition, waterproof, wide angle camera, and we attach it to a fishing line. So when the body goes overboard, you can see what dad sees and hears on the way down, pretty cool. And then what happens when the body hits the ocean floor, we reel it back in, plug it in the computer, and people can, people can enjoy seeing that option. So this is called the Atlantic and Pacific Sea Burial Shroud. And uh, it's designed in an English tow box design, which is kind of angular at the shoulders. And it's less than half the price, less than a third of the price of a typical casket. And it's designed to degrade. The cannonballs, there are four cannonballs that are 37 and a half pounds each, smelted in a factory here in Massachusetts. And they create the 150 pounds of required weight. And uh, the families put the cannonballs in the burial shroud and then they can write messages on the burial shroud. Now to fully answer your question, the regulations on a full body burial, embalming is not preferred. Not prohibited, but just not preferred. Refrigeration is best. Funeral homes, many of them have, by the way, there are 22,000 funeral homes in America, of which 2,000 are a public company and the remaining are independent funeral directors, meaning family owned type directors. And uh, the funeral directors uh, like what we do because we specialize in this and we work with them, not against or competing with them. So they're with us every step of the way from the first phone call to when we come back to the dock. And we'll talk about how we do a full body burial. But the other part of the regulation, Jeremy, is that you have to have inside your device, inside your uh, burial shroud, uh, three uh, 
call them straps around your shoulders or waist and legs so that you, you stay uh, connected to the apparatus. And the body has to be identified. And you can dress in your best Sunday tennis clothes, uh, whatever you want, but ocean-friendly cotton types of products. Mm. Who is sea burial primarily for? Really good question. You know, in America, there are 175 million Americans that live within 10 miles of the water. And if you grew up in Philadelphia and you retire in Tucson, you always come home to be buried. That's just the way the culture is here in the United States. There are 330 million Americans in the United States, of which every year about 0.8% die. So three plus million. And about four years ago, the NFDA, the National Funeral Directors Association, announced that by the year 2035, 78% of all Americans, or all of our population, I should say, will be cremated. And there are a number of reasons for that. One, land is becoming scarcer. People want simplicity. They want to pay less money. For instance, the average cremation rate across America, cremation cost, is about $3,500. That's average. So for instance, in Massachusetts, the least expensive is about $1,400. The most expensive is about, is about $7,000. And the difference in those prices really is pomp and circumstance, how you celebrate the life of your loved one. But today, the advantage of cremation over a traditional in-ground burial, which runs about anywhere from $7,500 to $15,000, is that cremation can allow you to take a deep breath, figure your family planning so when you want to have your celebration, and maybe schedule it for two, three, four months down the road or two years down the road. Now, when somebody dies, you don't automatically get cremated. You have to have a funeral home because, well, you don't have to. You could actually bring mom on the back of your Subaru, but not many people do that. You need a funeral home typically for pickup, care, custody, death certificate paperwork, medical examiner paperwork. And then there's a two-day waiting period. And the two-day waiting period is to rule out foul play because once you cremate a body, there is no uh, tissue analysis left to be had. So you want to make sure that the medical examiner who signs off at every single death wants to make sure that they have a uh, cause of death. But sometimes they don't have a cause of death because maybe there were drugs involved and they have toxicology reports that can take up to six to eight weeks. But the medical examiner can keep those tissue samples after they've harvested them and then they release the body for cremation. So then the body is cremated and uh, the family receives it usually within the week. They pick up at the funeral home, the funeral home drops off. But now with COVID, what's happening is the death rate has spiked. I mean, you take a look at 100,000 people that have lost their lives, plus and growing every single day. Uh, that's just 1 30th of the 3 million that die per year. But it's putting a huge taxing burden on scheduling for crematories. So sometimes people are waiting two, three, four weeks for cremation pickup. So uh, the people that choose cremation are anywhere from, I'm going to say 40 years of age to about 70. And the ones that are 70 to 90 years of age, they never really talked about death, but their families understand the changing death culture and cremation is kind of the way to go. And the family makes that decision for the decedent versus the decedent making their uh, uh, decision known, which on, on a few very important documents, I always tell folks, we're not lawyers, by the way, we're not sociologists, we're not funeral directors, we're business people, and we're licensed captains. Write your wishes down. I want this color flower, I want to be scattered at sea out of this particular port, and I want so many people in attendance, and I want to have banana wrap sandwiches, whatever you want to have. Make sure you write it down and have it notarized. It doesn't cost anything to have it notarized. You go to your local bank and they stamp it, because then it has to be uh, executed on your behalf. And of course, you want to also have uh, your, up until you die, your durable power of attorney. You want to have a healthcare proxy. You want to have a will. But people try to write this in their will. Not recommended because wills not, might not be read for uh, 60 to 90 days post-death. And so that's the cremation group. So out of the 3 million that die per year in the United States, 
Uh, right now, almost 50% nationwide, more on the West Coast, 60 to 70% California up to Oregon. And here in the Northeast, uh, it's catching on where it's 35 to 40% of total deaths. And it's just more simplistic. Uh, it allows a family time to grieve and not be rushed into planning and traveling and, and, and doing all that in a short, you know, five to seven day period. So uh, cremate, and, and the changing death culture, the death culture is greening itself, meaning in ground natural burials with no casket, no vaults. Uh, scatterings at sea or full body burials at sea or simple cremation and scattered across uh, 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 public land if you have approval uh, uh, via the ocean if you use a uh, uh, certified licensed uh, scattering provider like ourselves we're probably the largest in the country and uh, uh, it gives folks times to think I hope that answers the question yeah yeah for sure now, I see that you work with all different types of organizations. Um, could you tell me, maybe in your experiences, how military burial at seas differ from citizen burials at sea? Sure. Uh, first, let me tell you how we do a burial at sea, then we'll come back to military. Sure. But let, let, let's talk about a military burial at sea. And a regular burial at sea, we just take out the military part. So Uncle Charlie dies. The family arranges with New England burials at sea to do a scattering at sea. And what we do at no charge for the family, if Uncle Charlie had a satisfactory, honorable discharge from any one of the five different military services, or now six, I think, with Space Force, uh, uh, we need his DD-214, which is his discharge paper, showing his honorable discharge. And then we need his social security number so we can get a flag from the post office. And we gather dockside, whether it's one person or 400, and we have a beautiful, dignified, meaningful, and very proper send-off. What that means is we contact, say, the Navy. And they'll come, they'll send two Navy sailors and a bugler. And we gather in a semicircle, and I explain to the family, because they not, don't very often know. And by the way, a lot of families say no to a military honor guard because dad never talked about it we strongly encourage it because the grandchildren can see what grandpa earned and at the end of those events in almost all cases people say you know you were 100 percent right and it was so beautiful and i'll never forget it so what happens is we line folks up in a semicircle i explain the war history or the record of the decedent and then i explain what each and every service member that's attending what their experience is, where they were overseas, what their, what their expertise is, how long they've been in. And you know, they like that too, because they become part of the celebration. Then I explain what the 12, 13 folds, I'm sorry, the 13 folds of the US flag means. And then I explain what TAPS means. And then I say, color guard, please. And they take over, they unfold, fold the flag while sounding TAPS, and they present to the next of kin. There isn't a dry eye in the house. Everybody's got a lump in their throat. And then with the Navy, for instance, we play the naval hymn and then anchors away and we board people on the boat and we head three miles out to sea and have a beautiful sea tribute. That can include some readings and some music. We have a nice selection of non-denominational maritime readings or families might have their own. We play some of their favorite music. And then either folks scatter the cremated remains or they deploy an urn. And an urn, an ocean-friendly urn looks like this. It's a little shiny because it's got plastic on it to protect from my finger oil, and that comes off before it goes in. But this is designed to, wa uh, to, to kind of waffle around like that in the ocean for three to six minutes, and then it gently sinks. So some families opt to use a, an ocean-friendly urn. I always encourage families, less is more. You can spend less and just scatter right from the temporary urn that comes from the crematory because you then see the cremated remains. Now, families can see the cremated remains as we load that burial uh, uh, urn, because I think people should see them because, as I mentioned earlier, death is real. And it helps you understand, because the body's reduced to cremated remains. And we then deploy that urn or scatter with some rose petals to create a nice big rose petal field. And then we raise this Bergy flag, which is a yacht flag that has eight stars on it to indicate the eight bell end of watch blessing. 
and each family gets one of these. We fly it in the person's honor, and we ring the bell, which is a 400-year-old Plymouth Plantation schoolhouse bell, eight times as a final farewell. And what that means is that on a ship, there are seven watches to eight watches. The eighth watch is the end of bell watch, which means you can retire, you can relax, work out, study. It also means the passing of a friend. So this is a very nice memento that people can fly later on their own flagpole or they can mount it in a uh, shadow box. And I designed this and we get calls from all over the world for it. We typically don't sell it separately because we want to be able to have that as part of the family at sea tradition. So then we'll circle that cir uh, area of uh, rose petals. The last thing people see are either that urn going down or the rose petals moving away like little sailboats. It's quite beautiful. And then we fire the ship's cannon in the person's honor. We circle the area to a couple of favorite songs and we come in. And that takes about two hours and 15 minutes. And then we give the family a certificate that looks like this, showing the uh, date, time, latitude, and longitude. So, and it's suitable for framing that, and that's my name on there. Uh, it doesn't mean anything except that I wanted to have a, a sample to show you. And uh, it's on a nice blue parchment paper. And the family can give that to each family member. We then come in and uh, we take care of the required EPA permitting. We also have uh, light beverages, water, sodas, diet, and regular, and some boats have a cash bar or BYOB policy if people want to bring beer or wine, which they're welcome to do. So that's what happens with a scattering at sea for everybody. And the military part, we either put on the front, or if there is no military, we just exclude that and we head out to sea. And we were out yesterday, and it was just a beautiful day out off of uh, New London, Connecticut, and a very nice... Uh, uh, family. They came to this country. They were first generation. They had nothing. They all became doctors and engineers. And they just had such love and gratification for what we were able to do for them yesterday. Because many times when people call us, it's about an eight minute phone call. And at every single phone call, I didn't know you could do it, how to do it, or where to do it. And we answer all those questions for them. And we are able to fulfill the final wish of their loved one. And you know something? These events at sea, Jeremy, are more for the family than for the decedent. I see it all the time. And when mom can respectfully uh, put uh, dad's uh, remains back into the planet, into the ocean column again, then she's showing responsibility, love, and affection to the rest of her family. And it becomes a terrific at sea event. Now, we do the same thing for a full body, just the way I explained all that with the only exception of the family puts the cannonballs in the burial shroud, they can write messages on the burial shroud, and they then uh, take the seesaw device we have and, and commit their loved one's body to the sea. And it goes quickly because it's got 150 pounds in it and the full body. And that is uh, a little more shocking to a family because it's instant. You know, there's dad, and then now dad's in the ocean. And then four or five minutes later, they say, you, you can feel, you can hear the big sigh of relief that dad wanted this. They were able to make it happen. And I'll tell you, my best, best friend died of a neuroblastoma. I might not be saying that right. And it was a, it was a, a tumor in the brain. And uh, he wanted a full body burial at sea. He was a lawyer. He helped me actually start New England burials at sea. And I'm going to tell you this. We did everything I just explained. And we went about 20 miles north of Provincetown at the end of Cape Cod. And we were at a place called Wildcat Knoll. And we're moving along at about 17 to 18 knots, about 20 miles an hour. And I see a shark come out of the water and he took a bird. I've never seen that. I'm on the water every day. I've never seen that. And then I saw a whale breach because that's where the whales live. And that's where we do these events because it's quite meaningful. And I said, this is the place. And I looked down, it was 700 feet of water. So I said, perfect. So we had 25 people aboard and we stopped and we had the uh, celebration like I just had described. And as soon as the body went over, I saw about 75 to 100 white-sided dolphins. They came out of the water, their eyes as big as tennis balls, and they're looking at me. And it was such an epiphany. And it's like, we've got them now. And I share that with families and you could see their emotion in their face saying that's exactly what we want. And we just want to do it the right way. We don't want to skip anything. So that's, that's why they're glad they found New England burials at sea. And by the way, 
even though we're New England Burials at Sea, we operate on the West Coast and down South. We have California Burials at Sea, Oregon Burials at Sea, Washington Burials at Sea. We have 290 names that roll up to our company because that's how people find us. And uh, that's what we do and how we do it. So as the captain um, and the full body gets place in the water and it sinks to the bottom how long is it is it expected to remain at the bottom of the sea impermanently no because it's consumed by the organisms of the sea and the reason why we have the 42 inches of grommet holes that are three quarters of an inch on the burial shroud that i showed you is it lets sea life go in and do what sea life does so with our testing that we've done with mammals, deceased mammals, it takes about 30 to 60 to 90 days to be fully consumed. And then that burial shroud, which is made of a heavy cotton canvas duck, an organic product. Duck is the name of the, of the uh, canvas. Uh, that degrades. And the only thing left are the cannibals. And the cannibals create their own reef system which again is good for small frailing fish, lobsters, crustaceans, and families get comfort knowing that at the bottom of the ocean, there's a reef where dad was laid to rest. So the goal is to have total consumption. We can't predict or tell you how quickly that'll happen because you've got salinity and ocean temperatures and ocean currents and all the things that go into the ingredients of uh, consumption of the body, but that's why we don't want the body to be embalmed because we don't want any organism to ingest that toxic uh, uh, solution. So tell me about the boats, the vessels. I see that you can offer up to 400 people on these vessels. Yes, uh, the average group size is 12 to 25. So the Coast Guard regulates the vessel size, Jeremy, of up to six passengers or more than six. So many people have like six passengers and a baby and they say, hey, can we squeeze them in? No, because a soul is a soul. So six souls allowed plus crew or up to 23 on that size boat or up to 200 or 400. Let me tell you, the, the average group size is about 12. But we've done a couple of real big ones, 400 passengers, 286 passengers. The 400 passenger one was for a very famous Vietnamese monk who lived in Montreal, Canada, and they all came down, they all wore white, they arrived by bus, they drank tea, they didn't speak, they did their chanting, and we had a beautiful event at sea. Roll the camera forward, about two years, we had one for a uh, scattering, that is, for a fellow who worked for Verizon, telephone company, was out mowing the lawn, came back, sat in his lazy boy, and didn't wake up. And his wife called me and said, he had a big insurance policy and we wanna spend it. I have 276 friends that want to come. I said, great, we can make that happen. So we departed out of Boston Harbor with 276 people for what turned out to be a beautiful event. However, the folks consumed uh, 21 bottles of vodka from the dock to Boston Light, and we were going out past Boston Light. And I'm 5'8", I'm not a big guy, and there was a six footer and another six footer, and one had a green band, the other had a yellow band. That means when you can eat aboard. And they were arguing because they were inebriated. I said, okay, that's it. I'm not on this planet to be a bouncer. Don't want to be. We don't want to lose anybody overboard. So from that event forward, we now forbid full hard spirits alcohol aboard because, you know, it's not a booze cruise. If they want to go on a booze cruise, that's somebody else. That's not us. We are uh, serious about what we do and we are very professional and we want to make sure people get out safely and come back safely. So the bigger events, if they're well managed and give you an idea in that 276 person event, I had 20 crew because I want to have one of mine for every 10 passengers because there are questions if you ever have a safety issue. Uh, so we as licensed captains and I'm a 100 ton licensed captain, which means I can take about four or 500 people. There are a lot of things that can happen, but there's about a thousand things you have to know to make sure they don't happen. And that's why you want to go with a licensed captain not just Uncle Charlie who owns a boat and you take people out and then you get ashes to blow back on your face and because of the, the wrong proximity of the boat to current and wind. Uh, so there are a lot of methods that work 
and some that don't. And with our, with our experience, we're really the expert. And because of that, we train folks in the funeral associations, in the funeral homes, funeral universities. We're on staff as uh, adjunct uh, instructors to come in and see burial certify. I created a whole program on teaching in 70 minutes with a PowerPoint and products like I'm showing you here uh, about what to do, what not to do, and the best methods and practice for sea burials, whether they're scatterings or full bodies. And we have a quiz and they have to pass the quiz and then we list them on our website, they being the funeral directors. So we send them pre-need, meaning pre-planning business, and at need, meaning dad died today. And then in turn, they, they use us as their provider. So we created a sea burial certification program. Funeral homes love it. It's no charge. We come train them. And we usually go on a Wednesday at one o'clock and they've got 10 or 15 funeral directors in their parlor that we train them. And the 70 minute session always turns into three hours because there's so many questions. And one of the things we've learned about this training and about what we do at sea is plastic is not our friend. And we are very ecologically minded. Plastic hurts turtles, hurts dolphins. So a lot of funeral directors like plastic because it keeps things together. And uh, we have to constantly train and retrain and retrain. You know, teaching is repetition to make sure the funeral directors understand the best methods and practices. So from two to 400 person events to making sure they're properly supervised and the funeral directors are properly trained, that's a real business. It's a big business. Have you ever had a request to do, say, like a, a husband and wife both untimely pass together? Could you see bury them at the same time, or is it one at a time? With a full body or for scatterings? Uh, either or. We've never had a request for a full body. We've been having more requests lately for unattended full bodies where nobody goes, just the crew and the cameras, and we photo document it. We have a lot of requests for mom and dad, or mom's waiting for dad because dad's on the mantle. And uh, we then, combine, like yesterday, we combine the cremated remains of their loved ones into one scattering. And many times people are married 50 and 60 years and they'd like to be together for eternity. So that's a very common request. Now what happens is when somebody dies today in today's culture, Year one, if they're cremated, they go on the mantle and the Christmas lights or the menorah or however people celebrate their holiday adorn the uh, urn, temporary or full-fledged marble, metal, wood, whatever, on the, on the mantle. And then in year three, that urn goes into the sports closet behind the golf bag. And then in year five, when people move, we get the phone call. And that's okay. There is no protocol for as I mentioned earlier, for timing on scattering or on cremation. So that's the beauty, again, of that feature and benefit that you're able to uh, uh, use that uh, type of final uh, uh, disposition and then scatter at will. So many times moms wait for dads or dads wait for moms and they, and they go together. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you mentioned for me to... Uh bring up the uh, stream and possibly lake burials? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, because the EPA regulates what we do and how we do it, we have to be three miles to sea, three miles east of the line of demarcation or the west coast west of the line of demarcation. Actually, no, correction, west coast has changed. They do so many burials at sea, they have a 500 yard rule. You only have to be 500 yards off the west coast. I don't believe in that because it takes time for you to get on the boat to understand what's happening, to process that dad died, to talk with your cousins and aunts and uncles. And by the time we get out three miles, that usually all happens. You can't do that in 500 yards. What I did with Babson College in Wellesley, Massachusetts, is I developed an urn that is ocean friendly. And it's also uh, culturally friendly. Meaning, for instance, in the Hindu culture, they like to use incense and rice and dye. So this urn, which is about the size of this and it's cylindrical, is they can put their incense in, but if they don't use that option, that's fine. But what it does, it's got a secret ingredient that I can't tell you because the patent is pending on it, it comes from Canada, that totally neutralizes the phosphates in your cremated remains. So me, 
I am uh, 200 pounds. I like haagen ice cream. That's my problem. And uh, if I get cremated, I'll probably be nine and a half pounds of cremated remains. 52% of those cremated remains are phosphates. Phosphates are not a friend to the water table, the ocean. Phosphates create algae bloom, which is called red tide, which chokes out rivers, lakes, and streams and shellfish. So our secret ingredient totally neutralizes the phosphates in your cremated remains. So you leave the planet with fewer footprints than you came. And with my background at the sharp image of creating and developing product, I decided it needs to be breakthrough technology, which it is. It needs to be breakthrough pricing, which it is. It's a $99 retail when other urns are $500 to $800 at a funeral. And it's got to be functional. So it's in almost finished in development. It'll be made here in Massachusetts. And uh, it's called the Green Urn. And it's not green. It's kind of a white, kind of a sail color, sailcloth color. And we believe that'll answer a lot of questions for folks that are scratching their head. Do they want to buy an urn, but they don't want to spend 700? Will they spend 99? Probably. And is it smart? Yes, it is. Not technically electronically, but it's smart in that it neutralizes uh, phosphates. And uh, it's well thought out. And it won an award, and uh, Babson College students uh, helped us design it, and we're very proud of it. Oh, awesome. Now, is it generally illegal maybe to randomly scatter say grandma's ashes wherever an individual wants by themselves yes Hmm. and there 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 is no ash police but i will tell you that for instance on long island uh jones beach it's a ten thousand dollar fine for the scattering of cremated remains the wrong way and I tell folks that, and they just say, oh, geez, we don't want that to happen. We'll come to you. Or they say, oh, I'll just do it. I'll go out in the afternoon when nobody's there. And I tell them, well, if you do that, be wary of the potential fine. Also, make sure that the wind is at your back and the tide is outgoing and wear a sweater. They say, why wear a sweater? I said, don't wear a sweater. Don't wear a sweater. And they say, why? I said, because if dad blows back on you, he's going to stick all through on your sweater. <laughs> and they say, I don't, we don't want that. So. You can scatter on public land, for instance, let's say Acadia National Park in Maine. If you had permission from the park police, you could, but you have to get that permission. Uh, Rivers, lakes, and streams is a no-go. So because of that phosphate issue. So uh, we recommend and suggest that you use a licensed, insured provider like ourselves. And there's really only two of us, our affiliate on the West Coast and ourselves that understand the rules and regulations and so you don't have to deal with that. I mean, when people come out with us, they don't even want to give a cash gratuity at the time of, they want to prepay it because they don't want to deal with any detail like that. They want to hyper-focus on why they're there. And we understand that. So why have a nice event at sea and you have 30 people to the beach in a Gunkwit, Maine, and then all of a sudden the park police come and break it up. That's quite an embarrassment for the family. People flew in, they're paying for hotels. Just do it the right way. You also mentioned a air scattering with a, an airplane. Yes, many people uh, that call us love boating and they love airplanes and they're pilots, they're private pilots, they're commercial pilots. So, and I don't have it here, I should have brought it, I, I'm sorry, but I'll explain it. It's about the size of a bread bag. It's called the air glide. And on one side it has our patent pending valve and the other side you put the cremated remains in. So we go up on a Cessna 172, and the beauty of a airplane scattering is that we can geo-target mom's cremated remains over Isla Shoals in New Hampshire or uh, uh, Catalina in California. Uh, we go around and we can geo-target within 500 yards. So we go up, we do one pass down the tarmac. Actually, let me, let me back up. We have a nice, tarmac side service like i explained for the regular burial sea with a couple of readings and some music usually some willie nelson music he's got a great song called blue skies and people love that and we play that it's meaningful for them and then uh we get in the we, we load that we load the air glide with dad's cremated remains right in front of the family so they can see it and then just the pilot and myself we go up or one of my designees and we do one pass 
down through the tarmac with red rose petals because you can see those in the air, they're beautiful. And then we dip our wings and we head three miles out to sea. And then we scatter at a specific location which the family might choose. And then we come in and everything else is pretty much the same. That's all photo documented also with video. And one really cool event is we had a Navy uh, Admiral who commanded the fifth fleet for 40 years and trust us to take his mom up during a bitter cold icy day where we couldn't get a boat out of the harbor in Groton, Connecticut. And as we did everything I just mentioned, it was just he and his brother, who's also a captain of an aircraft carrier. Uh, we headed out past Groton. It was really cool because a nuke sub was just going down and one was just coming up because they change watches. And I said, wow, that is so cool. The Navy Admiral would love that. So you see some pretty cool things. You see wildlife, you see submarines, and uh, all of that is captured on film for the family. So air scatterings are, are uh, uh, limited to weather days. And uh, let me just fix this here one second. Uh, weather days, and we uh, do a great job at them. And we have pilots. I won't go up with a pilot without at least 15,000 hours of airtime. How do you get 15,000 miles of airtime? Well, they fly freight overnight for FedEx, UPS, DHL. And, uh, you know, I'm entrusting my life to that pilot and the completion of the mission for the family. So we want to make sure we do it uh, not in, a, in an experimental way. We do it 100% of the way. Another idea a lot of individuals come to me with is the idea of fusing their ashes with a type of cement and adding that to like say a coral reef do you come in uh, do you get a lot of requests like that and do you offer that we experimented with the reef program about seven years ago and to make it work successfully for us we needed to be able to have the bandwidth of being able to do that from maine down to miami and over to sarasota the florida legislature is a lot more reef friendly than Maryland north to Maine. Because in my area of the country, in the Northeast, the authorities think of ocean reefs as being obstructions to navigation, God forbid, that a reef is, you know, 80 feet down. Uh, so we didn't have a huge interest level or spike in the Northeast. There's a bigger one down south, and we abandoned the project. It was called the Great Burial Reef. We abandoned it because if we can't do it right, we're not going to do it. There's another company that does it, and they're different in that they, to make it work for them financially and economically, they have five families in each reef. Now, I don't know five friends that I want to be buried with, let alone five families that I don't know. So, uh, so we don't offer the reef. But, you know, a lot of times people want stuff, memorial gear. And part of that was the reef program because you could go fish or scuba dive to Grandpa's Reef, which is a nice idea. A big company, I'll leave unnamed, created a huge reef out by the Atlantis area down in Florida, but they didn't factor in salinity. So picture this. There's a beautiful underwater reef with lions and all kinds of statues. And it looked like it was a bank with all the safety deposit vaults. But what happened was over a very short period of time with the salinity and the marine growth is all of the crustaceans and, 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 and uh, 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 you know, kelp and everything that grows underwater started attaching itself to these uh, well-defined uh, niches to put your loved one's cremated remains in. And they couldn't find it. So they had to go in there with a chisel and hammer and figure it out. So, ah, we don't want any part of that. So, uh, what we do offer is a lot of merchandise, not a lot, but really good quality stuff. Like for instance, this is a, uh, an item that families like, I'll hold that a little bit closer. Uh, that shows the, I'm not sure what size right there, but my name and then the latitude and longitude of my office. And that would be, for instance, the latitude and longitude of where we scattered dad and a message on, on one side that says, uh, love you or see you on the other side or, or his name or her, her name. These come in, sterling silver and they come in uh, stainless steel and we make them as uh, small dog tags or key rings. We also have uh, some, uh, uh, some people put their cremated remains in a beautiful DNA style uh, 
light art object. We have those available called crystal remembrance. And sometimes people uh, want to have things made in a diamonds, ashes made in it. We, we don't do that because that's so specialized. Uh, but uh, that people really want something tangible of where they uh, deployed their loved one, and we have that available for them. So we mentioned a lot about flame cremation. Have you ever heard about water cremation? I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with it because we, were, uh, we are working on a program with the University of South Texas out of Dallas. And it's called Water Resonation, I believe. And they, in their medical school, have 4,000 cadaver uh, uh, operations a year. I mean, they have that many people that come in and they teach. They have a wonderful school. Uh, people come in worldwide to train there. And what they do when they're done with their dissection is they use that uh, resonation process. The process is this. Rather than three hours of cremation at 1,800 plus degrees, it's eight hours of water compression with a lye product, which is, you know, it's a strong chemical. And it reduces the body to the same matter eight and a half, nine pounds of cremated remains, but it's different. And what's different about it is the color is white of the ashes, which nobody really cares about. They wouldn't know unless you told them. And the ashes float. Why? I don't know. But that's one of the things we ran into because they were looking to have us be their uh, provider of uh, scattering at sea services and not by, you know, eight pound bags of cremated remains, but 55 gallon drums full and a lot of them. Uh, and I said, well, you know, I don't think with that process, we're going to be able to, uh, do that effectively at sea. But so the process is quite different from a flame process. There is no flame. It uses a lye chemical, takes longer. It's quite interesting. I, I don't know if it's going to get off the launch pad, but uh, I see the fellows at the uh, funeral director shows and see their, their, their machines, which are all stainless steel and they look like a big cylindrical popsicle. And uh, I, I just, uh, I don't quite get it yet, but, it's out there. Yeah. So if a funeral home is interested in working with you, what's the process of linking up with you? So many times the funeral home will call us and say they've got the Mahoney's in and like to do either a pre-need or an at-need, meaning it happened yesterday, uh, scattering or full body burial at sea. And they don't know the answers to the questions that their client family will ask them. So that's when we have the sea burial certification process that we can sign them up and, and, and do that uh, training. And now we can use uh, Zoom to do that as well. But we can also talk them through it. So a funeral director will uh, take our information. We usually put together a quotation for them with all the supplemental information. And then uh, we send that over to them and they, and they can speak with their client family with an educated uh, background and they set it up with us. So the funeral home either pays us or the family pays us, and it's, it's pretty seamless. So we onboard funeral homes on a weekly basis, and uh, they like it because many times a funeral home will not do anything because they're in the business to do uh, traditional wake calling hours, two to four, seven to nine, or they have a cremation with none of that. That's called a direct scattering. And by adding our service, it adds a service to their menu. And also, it's a nice, uh, clean uh, way to uh, add more. Earlier, you mentioned that you're not in competition with funeral directors or funeral homes. But if a, say if someone passes away and they want to go straight to you guys to have them buried at sea, is that also an option? With a full body or with cremated remains? Uh, both. With cremated remains, absolutely. People come direct all the time. And uh, we're like the Bose company. You know, if you buy a pair of speakers that are $749 in Seattle, it's the same $749 in Miami. Our pricing is the same that the funeral director would offer. So there's no discounted deal by coming direct to us, but we can absolutely work with you. But with a full body, that's more intricate. As we talked about earlier, there's uh, pickup, care, custody. Uh, uh, paperwork and uh, also uh, delivery to the vessel. And the regulations in many states, not all of them, 
but many states require a funeral director to be present until the final committal of a body. So we always take a funeral director with good sea legs with us. They don't really do anything on board, but they're the license, so to speak, and they're there in case anything happened. Let, let me give you an example. We were in Florida going out of, I think it was, uh, it was Miami, Bayside of Miami. Nice family, full body burial at sea for their mom. And we're halfway out of the harbor. And one of the sons said, mom's not dead. I said, yes, sir, she is. I saw her and saw the death certificate. I don't believe it. She's not dead. And I indicated that she is, but I didn't want to arm wrestle with the client. Uh, so I immediately spoke with the funeral director because that's his job. And what happens is on a burial shroud, the body goes in and then we have a lock that goes on it. And we give the family the key. And it, I said to the client, to the, fam to, to, to the son, I can give you the key to the lock to unlock so you can see mom, but I don't recommend it because we want you to have the proper last fond memory image of mom, not one that she died two weeks ago and she hasn't been prepared. And, and he still didn't believe it. And what he saw was the, burial shroud move a little bit because the boat was rocking like this. And uh, so in his mind, uh, mom was in there and moving. So when you kind of dial in psychologically, uh, psycho psychology 101, I spoke with the funeral director and said, let's offer him the key, but tell him it's not recommended. So by offering him the key to the shroud, that was all they needed. The can't went away. And he now knew that he had the full authority to go take a look, but he took our advice and recommendation to not do so. And because of that, we had a great event at sea and he was thankful. It was just the psyche of, you know, my mother died and I didn't see her. So we always encourage a funeral director when, when they do a full body burial at sea is to what they call a set the features because you don't always die looking pretty and they have to set the eyes and the mouth and all that. So we recommend that they at least do that they're not doing a bombing, they're using refrigeration. But if the family wants the last look dockside, which we would approve, that's okay. And they get the finality of it. But we don't want to have a last look 70 miles to sea or five miles to sea because, you know, we don't want to have somebody have a medical because of their shock value and, uh, uh, and have to deal with that on a medical evac with the Coast Guard. That's not good. So uh, that's what that's all about. I spoke to a... Uh, uh a founder of a green cemetery and I asked him so what prevents people from burying dad say in the backyard are there any restrictions as to hey I, I get my own boat and bury a loved one out at sea okay so there are two questions there Jeremy one is can you bury dad in the backyard and then oh. well we, we answered that in the other episode but yeah so at sea what what kind of restrictions are What's required? Does there need to be a certified individual on the boat? That's a really good question. No. But if you use cousin Charlie's boat and he charges you and he's aboard and he charges you for fuel or food or ice, that's called a charter. It's very strict with US Coast Guard law. You need to be licensed. But if Cousin Charlie allows you to use his boat at no charge, then by all means, you can do it on your own. Just complete the EPA application that you need to file for, make sure that you uh, have all the paperwork in order. And uh, you absolutely can do a scattering or a full body burial at sea on your own, as long as you're not paying somebody that's an unlicensed captain. Now, here's kind of a war story. It was about maybe 10 years ago. Our phone rang off the hook one day, and it was uh, all about uh, a family that hired a uh, van because their uncle passed away, and they did everything properly. They put him, uh, they had all the paperwork. They iced him down with dry ice. They drove from South Carolina down to Fort Lauderdale, found the first boat they could find, and it was a licensed captain, so no problem there. And they went out and didn't use the proper receptacle like the burial shroud that I'm sharing with you and telling you about. And they didn't use the proper weight. And Mr. Lasky, it's, you can look it up on uh, 
Google, uh, the, it's called the botched sea burial, not by us, but by the family. And uh, they deployed his body overboard. And two days later, he ended up on the beach with just a sock on. And our phones rang off the hook. So that was an inexperienced captain and a family that didn't know what to do or how to do it. I can't blame the family because they entrusted the captain, but it was botched and it wasn't good. So you want to make sure that if you do a full body, that you have somebody that knows what they're doing. And can a family member do that? Absolutely. But just be cautious of the downside if a body reappeared. I saw on your website that you offer, say, memorial cruises as well. Uh, what kind of other services do you offer? Well, a memorial cruise, Jeremy, is defined as typically in the Catholic religion. People like to visit a uh, place of committal one year later. Or in the Hindu tradition, it could be up to uh, 60 days later. And uh, we offer a half-price cruise event, meaning we not like a big cruise that you have with an ocean liner, but we'd be happy to take the family out in the same boat. So they can lay a wreath, they can circle the area, they can uh, uh, pay their tribute uh, uh, accordingly, but just at sea. Earlier, you mentioned that you also offer classes and certifications. Do you want to talk on that? Uh, certification classes, sea burial certification, uh, where we train the funeral directors on best methods and practices. That's what we offer funeral homes. And many times we also speak at senior centers across America where non-funeral people come in, just regular folks like you and I, and they uh, uh, come in to learn. And there might be myself and a funeral director that talks about full body traditional funerals and, uh, or scatterings and answer a lot of the questions because the mystery of death and dying, it really is no longer taboo. Because when you're at the dinner table, the last thing people want to talk about is buying life insurance or their final burial plans. So the important thing to know is that uh, education is out there. Uh, people can call us toll free. We're happy to answer any questions they have. We have a very robust website, NewEnglandBurialsAtSea.com, with a lot of frequently asked questions and answers that folks don't know that they have yet. So the typical questions are, and by the way, we created another website called CapChats, C-A-P-C-H-A-T-S, CapChats.com, with the top 17, 14 or 17 questions. Can I bring kids out? How much does it cost? How do we do this? How do I get grandma aboard with the sit and spin? Uh, what should I wear? And there are a lot of frequently asked questions that everybody innocently has. And we tried to encapsulate that in a one simple, easy website, capchats.com, that will uh, answer many questions. And what happens is our website is so robust, so filled with good information, that people study it for about 30 or 40 minutes. And then when they call us, it's about an eight-minute phone call. So they've condensed down all their questions from 40 minutes down to eight, and they do our, their booking with us to make their reservation. So if people want to get certified, uh, where can they learn more? Do you do classes around, like, say, the, the coastal United States? Or do people go to you to learn in a classroom near you? We do both. And we're so busy at sea that we try to focus the calendar class list in the fall to late winter time of year. We haven't yet gone out and rented out a hotel room, you know, a conference room that we can take a full page ad out in a paper and say, hey, come learn. We'll get to that point. I expect that probably in the next couple of years. Uh, we don't publish a class list online yet because we don't have that program quite finalized, but we will. And I think uh, with this program that you're videotaping today with me, uh, that's going to answer a lot of questions for a lot of people. We'll point them that way because uh, you're asking some really good questions. Thank you. Uh, so what inspired you to take this path that you're on for sea burials? Well, I've always had a love for the ocean, Jeremy. I've been on the water since I was 12 years of age. And about 120 pounds ago, I used to be a water ski model for the Boston Whaler Company as a kid for $5 a day. 
I love the water. I'm on the water all the time. And when I went through uh, their academy in Braintree, Mass, then Ithaca College and Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, I came out wanting, you know, guns blazing to be in corporate America. And that worked for, you know, 25 years or so and uh, loved it. You know, brought a company public called The Sharp Rimage with uh, 10 or 15 other people. Great experience and introduced about 4,000 products. But, you know, just got tired of creating stuff for our planet. And I bought a nice boat, got my captain's license, and somebody said, hey, can you scatter my uncle's cremated remains? So one became 20, became 2,000, became a real business. And kind of the backstory to that is my family has been in the food business for generations. And back in the 1800s was in the milk business, which then later turned into ice cream. And my family used to deliver milk all throughout New England with horse carts drawn by Clydesdale horses. And my great uncle Edwin said, well, if we're not pulling milk carts in the afternoon, let's pull hearses. So the MC Kelly Funeral Home was born in Boston, Massachusetts. And as a kid, I used to work in a couple of funeral homes and drove hearses, picked up decedents, made flower stands, look nice, everything that you do in the funeral business. But I decided at 18 years of age, that was pretty sad for me and I'm a happy guy. So my life transitioned into education and into corporate America. So when that person asked me to scatter Uncle Charlie's ashes back in the year 2005, uh, I said, this is really great. I'm doing something for the family that they couldn't ordinarily do because they don't have a boat or a contact with a boat. I'm really good with a boat. And uh, I created this whole, I call it the Disney of death because we really go to great, organizational detail to make every single event perfect for the decedent and for the family. And because we can do that in a subtle but dignified and proper way at sea, it took off. So we've done thousands and people, as I mentioned earlier, come from all over the world to use our services, Germany, Australia, uh, the Asian Pac Rim, Canada, uh, Dubuque, Iowa. You know, it's, uh, it, it's fascinating how people come to us because they know we're really pretty much the experts at it. Talking about your education, I noticed on your resume, you graduated from the FBI in Boston? Yes, I was appointed by the Gillette Company to the Federal Bureau of Investigations uh, Corporate Citizenship Program, which you go through a 13-week training program. You gotta have a great background. We can not let you in the FBI without a background check, right? So with the security clearance, and go. We, I went through all types of white collar crime, uh, bad guy crime, forensics, and actually used some of my statistics from the FBI on forensics, so that it's helpful that way. And the FBI Citizens Academy is what I went through. There are probably 20 different chapters in the country. I think Boston is one of the largest, and I'm proud of that and had great contacts there. And uh, as a result, we now work with, not just because of that, but we work with the FBI, the Secret Service, and the CIA because we do it properly. We don't cut any corners. Here's a for instance. We're on Nantucket Island. I've got a 75-foot boat and 30 passengers coming aboard. And as we're making our way from Hyannis, Massachusetts over to Nantucket, my phone's ringing off the hook. What dock are you coming to? Where are you going to meet? What time? And I said, who's calling, please? And they wouldn't identify themselves. So I said, well, you need to tell me who you are before I give you that critical information because we don't know if it's an estranged wife or husband or bill collector. So three phone calls later, he finally said, this is Jerry from Baba. I said, oh, why didn't you just say that? So we went into the dock. We picked up the 30 passengers and Jerry was number 30. Uh, Well-built, well-dressed guy, a little shorter than me, so I felt good. And uh, he said, thank you so much for your confidentiality and discretion. My name's Jerry. I'm the number two guy at the Secret Service. And he said, you'll get a lot of business because of that, because of the confidentiality and discretion. So uh, we often don't know who we have aboard. And we pretty much try to do some reference checks on people. Because when you're at sea, you know, you're not on land. And we find that uh, many people are quite regular and uh, without a lot of drama or baggage. We've had a few. But uh, one thing that is for sure is that... Uh, when we have uh, folks aboard, they, they're under our watch and key. And we let them know that the captain's in charge 
and many times we get type A personalities that want to run everything, and we have to politely ask them to kind of back up, let us handle it, like leave the driving to us type of thing. And as long as we properly and effectively and passionately explain that, then uh, then we're okay. Well, as we wrap up the conversation, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or mention? Yes, talk with your family. It's really important because many times when folks call us, I can tell you about 60% of the time, the people that call us, they're called informants because they're the ones that make the plan. So the informant calls us, I don't know what dad wanted. We think this is what he may have wanted. 40% of the time it's all scripted out. It's written down, final wishes, uh, uh, notarized the way it should be. So talk with your family. Say, what would you like to have happen in your uh, final planning? Uh, have you thought about it? Uh, is an ocean full body burial or a scattering at sea by a boat or airplane something you have an interest in because you were in the Navy or you, 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 you fished all the time or you, you love to be at the beach down in the Outer Banks or Florida or up in Maine uh, or out in Catalina uh, or the Pacific Northwest? There are a lot of people that love the ocean and many times they come to us because dad or mom loved their vacation spot. So it's okay to talk with your family about the planning. It's not taboo. And if you write us or call us, we'll send you a no charge uh, family wishes planner that kind of outlines in a very simple, easy to understand way of uh, what you would like the final uh, act to be. You can script it out. So I encourage people to talk. Where can people learn more about you and the services you provide? Thank you for asking. We have a toll-free number that people can use, and they're welcome to use it. It's 877-897-7700. I'll repeat that, 877-897-7700. And I strongly encourage uh, your viewers to check us out online at newenglandburialsatsea.com, newenglandburialsatsea.com. And I'd like to uh, offer your viewers something special if, they're, if they watch this entire uh, program with you and they'd like to plan something, is that if they mention your program name and your name, Jeremy, we'd be happy to offer the free, a free $100 rose petal package. And we'll also give one of these, which is a $100 silver uh, dog tag with their loved one's name on it. Just as kind of a thank you for, 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 for listening and watching uh, your program today, Jeremy, and maybe sharing sharing it with their friends and family would be more than honored to do that. Happy to do that. Uh, just make sure they mention your name and your program name. Awesome. So yeah, to the audience, be sure to mention Death Science while booking with uh, Captain Brad White. Now, Captain Brad White, thank you so much for not only coming on the show, but everything you do from helping families uh, through uh, the hard time in their life of a passing of a loved one to also providing alternative burial services and also promoting a, a healthier environment. For all that, thank you so much. Jeremy, thank you. And we learn in every single event, and I'm delighted that you invited us on your program. I hope uh, your viewers uh, learned a lot today, and uh, they're welcome again to call with questions. And I wish you the very best. You're doing a great thing educating the public on the changing death care industry and how it is okay to talk about it. So. From New England Burials at Sea.com here in beautiful Massachusetts. Uh, you all have a great day and thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching the Death Science Podcast. For updates and new episodes, subscribe right now. It's quick at deathscience.org. Remember that we almost die one day, so talk to your loved ones now about your post life plans for your body. Learn more about creative and beneficial post-life plans at restinggrounds.org. I'm your host, Jeremy, signing off. Thank you and pimenta mori.